Let's get it out of the way early. The Nasty Boys are never going to top anyone's favourite tag team list. Inside the wrestling ring, they were stiff brawlers who didn't indulge in technical grappling or wondrous high-flying moves. Some would even say the Nasty Boys were sloppy and careless in the squared circle. Outside the ring, they were known as confrontational and got themselves involved in several legitimate fights. To put it lightly, they were probably not the most professional men in the locker room. We may not be fans of Brian Knobs and Jerry Sags, but they did manage to get over in the WWF during the early 90s, a time when the company's tag team division was firing on all cylinders. A lot has already been said about the Nasty Boys and their antics outside of the ring, and while we certainly can't tell the story of the Nasty Boys without discussing some of these incidents, Nobs and Sag's professional achievements as a tag team is nothing to scoff at. With one WWF, three WCW and two AWA tag title reigns, and also voted the PWI Tag Team of the Year in 1994, surely they couldn't have been that bad, right? This time we take a look at the story of the Nasty Boys. Not many tag teams are formed by childhood friends, but this was indeed the case for Brian Nobbs and Jerry Sags. They both attended Whitehall High School in Pennsylvania, and apparently it was their high school friend Matt Millen who suggested that Nobbs and Sags got into pro wrestling, due to both men travelling down a path that would have ended up with jail time. This friend Matt Millen would go on to win four Super Bowl rings as an NFL linebacker, Sounds like a glamorous story, but this is what Brian Knobb said in an interview. In 1985, Knobbs and Sags attended Vern Gagne's wrestling camp. They paid their dues before getting their break in the AWA, driving the ring from show to show and helping to set it up at venues. In 1986, the team were given a break when they were named the Nasty Boys. How did they get their name? Well, Jerry Sags said... We're not the Nasty Boys for nothing. When we came up in the business, we were given that name by Vern Gagne's daughter after she went out with us one night. Whatever that means. As explained in the previous Rockers video uploaded on the channel here, the CWA in Memphis was an affiliate to the AWA. The Nasty Boys really started moving up the cards while working in Memphis, notably feuding with the Rock and Roll RPMs and the Midnight Rockers. Jerry Lawler tried different looks for the Nasty Boys while they worked in Memphis, even giving the tag team face paint at one point. Speaking of the Nasty Boys' look and gimmick, there really wasn't anyone else doing this type of thing in the mid-80s. Knobs and Sags portrayed no-nonsense street punk rockers, and to their credit, they did look unique. Sure, this kind of look would become more commonplace as the years progressed, but back then, the Nasty Boys did stand out, if only for their look. Maybe more so than their actual in-ring abilities. In 1990, the Nasty Boys made their way to WCW where they mostly feuded with the popular Steiner Brothers. Normally in these videos I try to recommend a few matches for you guys to watch afterwards, and while there won't be a ton of Nasty Boys recommendations here, I need to point your attention to Halloween Havoc in 1990. The Nasty Boys challenged the Steiners here for the US tag titles and the match is surprisingly good. The crowd is hyped for the match, the match starts off very hot, and what follows is probably the Nasty Boys best ever match, in my opinion anyway. It's so good looking back at old tag matches like this, where the tag teams actually worked as teams. The Frankensteiner to end the match also looked quite brutal, but still a great match that you should check out. Maybe Vince McMahon was watching Halloween Havoc in 1990, as it wouldn't be long until the Nasty Boys made their way to the WWF. As a matter of fact, it was just two months later. Before joining the WWF though, we have to talk about the Ken Shamrock incident that happened around this time, simply because it highlights the Nasty Boys' reputation of being not so friendly guys. The brief of the story is as follows. 
The Nasty Boys were in a club, Ken Shamrock, a friend, and this friend's girlfriend entered the same club. The Nasty Boys had one too many drinks and they start hitting on this female, something that Shamrock didn't take too kindly to. Shamrock even said, when recounting the story, that Nobbs was grabbing the woman's breasts. Nobbs and Sags ended up getting thrown out of the club and they went back to their hotel room. Shamrock went to their hotel room later that night. Now, here is where the different stories come into play about what happened next. Remember, the only people who know exactly what happened here were the Nasty Boys and Ken Shamrock, so you have to decide yourself who's telling the truth here and who's in the right. Ken Shamrock said he kicked the door in and noticed Nobbs was out cold on the bed. He was then blindsided by Sags and the Nasty Boys proceeded to give him a kicking and threw him off a second floor balcony. Ken had to go to hospital afterwards, the Nasty Boys broke his sternum and his nose. The Nasty Boys say that Shamrock kicked the door in and started laying punches in the knobs while he was out cold sleeping on the bed. Sag said that this is when he got involved to protect his friend. We know for sure there was a fight that took place that left Shamrock in hospital. Keep this in mind though, as the Nasty Boys and Shamrock would cross paths once again. Also keep in mind that both Nobs and Sags had no issues bragging to everyone who would listen that they beat up the world's most dangerous man and put him in hospital. They basked in that glory for quite some time. So on to the WWF now and the Nasty Boys would be managed by Jimmy Hart upon their arrival. They wasted absolutely no time at all in becoming the number one contenders for the tag team titles and they marched into WrestleMania 7 and defeated the Hart Foundation to capture the tag titles. The Nasty Boys held on to the gold until SummerSlam 91 where they were defeated by the Legion of Doom in a no DQ match which was, I have to admit, quite entertaining. From here, the Nasty Boys would end the year feuding with the Rockers and the Bushwhackers. After WrestleMania 8, where the Nasty Boys were defeated in an 8 man tag team match, the Nasty Boys got rid of Jimmy Hart and turned babyface. Jimmy Hart was showing more preference to another tag team that he managed, Money Inc. And when Jimmy overlooked the Nasty Boys for a tag shot in favour of DiBiase and IRS, Nobbs and Sags decided it was time for him to go. This led to a feud between the Nasty Boys and Money Inc that lasted throughout most of 1992. After coming into the WWF with what was seemingly a huge push, the Nasty Boys were quickly losing any steam they once had. In the lead up to WrestleMania 9, the original plan was for the Nasty Boys to take on Money Inc for the tag gold, but strangely, the team decided to step aside, in storyline anyway, to allow the team of Hulk Hogan and Brutus Beefcake to take on Money Inc on the grand stage. You can only imagine how pissed off Nobbs and Sags must have been, missing out on that WrestleMania paycheck that generally made up a good portion of a WWF superstar's annual wage. Hulk Hogan's 1993 comeback to the WWF was the reason the Nasty Boys missed out on this match. Nobbs and Sags would not last much longer with the WWF after the WrestleMania 9 incident. It's been reported that on the annual European tour after WrestleMania, the team were suspended and then fired due to their behaviour. The Nasty Boys disputed this in their shoot interview with RF Video. The Nasty Boys claimed they asked Vince if they could talk with WCW because they felt there was nothing left to do in the company. So back to WCW the Nasty Boys went and the team would remain here from mid 1993 to early 1997. During this tenure in WCW, the Nasty Boys picked up three tag team title reigns, which is really something we shouldn't overlook, but do keep in mind, Hulk Hogan had a lot of say in the booking of WCW during this time period, and the Nasty Boys were tight with the Hulkster. Nonetheless, the Nasty Boys defeated Arn Anderson and Paul Roma at Fall Brawl 1993 to become tag champions, but they lost the titles to Marcus Bagwell and Two Cold Scorpio shortly afterwards. Saying that, they quickly regained the gold in a rematch. In early 1994, the Nasty Boys had some seriously wild matches with Cactus Jack and Max Payne that wouldn't have looked out of place in ECW. 
Televised street fights on WCW were not really all that common, so it was refreshing to see matches like this on TV. But Mick Foley was seriously not a fan of the Nasty Boys during or after this time period. Check out Mick's first book for more info, but very basically here, Mick Foley didn't like their attitudes and thought they were sloppy and careless in the ring. Eventually, the Nasty Boys lost the titles to Kevin Sullivan and Cactus Jack at Slamboree 1994, a team that was thrown together due to the injury of Kevin Sullivan's kayfabe brother. The tag matches between the Nasty Boys and Cactus Jack and Max Payne helped the Nasty Boys secure that PWI Tag Team of the Year award in 1994. However, nothing of note would happen for most of 1995 for the Nasty Boys. They mainly feuded with Harlem Heat, even winning the tag titles from Booker T and Stevie Ray, but again quickly losing the titles to the same team. 1995 was that weird period in WCW where the company were still trying to figure out what to do with all these ex-WWF stars and really there was nothing notable here for the nasty boys to sink their teeth into. When the NWO was born the next year, knobs and sags were made to look like chumps when they thought they had gained membership to the faction only to get beaten down afterwards. The New World Order beatdown led to a series of matches featuring the Nasty Boys vs the Outsiders. You've maybe heard this story before, but Scott Hall and Jerry Sags got into a legit shoot fight during a match that pretty much spelled the end for the Nasty Boys, one way or the other. During the match, Sags was struck on the head with some force, believed to be with a chair. He got enraged and began attacking Scott Hall in the ring, leaving his face bloody and knocking out a few of his teeth. Nobbs said, I don't think it was done on purpose. Sags may have thought it was. It was all done before cameras were even coming on, so he didn't even need to get hit that hard. When he got hit, he cracked a couple of his vertebrae at the back of his neck. Scott has been friends of ours since the AWA days. We were good friends, and Kevin, never had a beef with him in my life. It's all good. Kevin Nash went into more detail when he said, There was a spot for Sean Waltman to come in and the run-in was miscued. Sags threw the chair in the ring, and if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't a folding chair. The ring was lit up, but the outside of the ring was dark, and Scott threw the chair back outside, and it hit Sags. Sags came into the ring and I see him and Scott exchanging blows in the middle of the ring. I went out and got the announce table, I brought it back in the ring and lifted it over my head and they all bailed. I looked at Scott and he was pouring blood all over his face. I was livid. I went to the back and grabbed a baseball bat. I swung the bat above Nobbs and Sags' head. I was going to kill them. Scott said, no man, he thinks he is right. Finally, Sag said of the backstage incident, I hear this noise from the shower. Kevin Nash came into the locker room with a bat. Nash was saying, we'll see who's got the stroke in this company. That was pretty much him telling us we were getting fired. At the time, they were practically booking, and I've just knocked the booker's teeth down his throat. When we watched the tape back, it was a case of, oh my god, it wasn't Scott with the chair, it was Kevin Nash with the tag belt. So yeah, there seems to be a bit of confusion here about what really happened, with Kevin's story not really matching up with Sag's recollection of events. It doesn't really matter though how Sag's got hit or who done it. All that really matters is that there was a legit fight in the middle of the ring and a performer was left bloodied up. And it's only a performer who had some political pull within the company. Apparently Scott didn't want anyone to get fired, Nash was fuming and it was also reported that Eric Bischoff was going to fire the Nasty Boys on the spot at the next Nitro tapings in New Orleans. Sags ended up filing a lawsuit against WCW and the Outsiders and Kevin Nash reported that he got a settlement of $12 for his troubles. Sags was released from his contract, while Nobbs had an unsuccessful singles run in WCW where he tried to capture the WCW Hardcore Championship. So remember that Ken Shamrock incident? Well, around this time, Shamrock had made it to the WWF, which would have been 1997 or thereafter. 
The Nasty Boys bumped into Ken at an airport. Remember also, the Nasty Boys had been saying to anyone who would listen that they beat up Ken Shamrock, trying to tarnish the tough guy reputation once held by the world's most dangerous man. Well, when they met up at the airport, there was a confrontation. The Nasty Boys claimed that they told Shamrock if he has a problem, then do something about it. According to the Nasty Boys, Ken Shamrock then stormed off and done nothing. Shamrock tells the story quite differently. He said that he offered Sags the first punch and Sags said to him, if you hit me, it's a federal offence. Shamrock then said this was all he needed to prove that the Nasty Boys were, in his words, pussies. Shamrock said he didn't need to lift a finger as they both showed what kind of people they were when they backed out of the fight and threatened Shamrock with the boys in blue. The Nasty Boys were brought back to the WWE very briefly in 2007, but they got heat for a terrible performance in a dark match. Apparently, in this one match, they took way too long to get to the ring because they were busy talking to friends and family at ringside. They acted like this was a major return of two main event guys, and they worked really stiff against a 21-year-old Drew McIntyre. This particular dark match led to the SmackDown taping getting totally screwed up time-wise, giving WWE just 6 minutes to change the ring and set for the ECW on Sci-Fi tapings. In 2010, the Nasty Boys showed up in TNA, where they feuded with the Dudley Boys. At Against All Odds in 2010, the Nasty Boys defeated Team 3D when Jimmy Hart made his return to the company and helped the Nasties pick up the win. In the rematches that followed, Team 3D would score the wins. The Nasty Boys ended up getting fired from TNA due to their behaviour at a Spike TV function, where apparently they were disrespectful towards Spike TV executives. And that's really it for the Nasty Boys. The gimmick aged extremely badly as the years went on. In the early 80s, yeah, a couple of nasty street punks who done nothing but brawl may have been cool, but that shelf life was really limited. When they got to the WWF and they were putting their opponents' faces in their armpits on a global platform, yeah, maybe it was already becoming silly. They also had a terrible reputation in the business for being unprofessional and taking liberties with other talent, but that being said, they made their money in wrestling and had the opportunity to perform on a grand stage. Their reputation precedes them though, and it can be argued that the Nasty Boys done more harm to the wrestling business than good. <laughs> 